this is Dolio, an original thriller fiction podcast presented in serialized format, a chapter at a time, written by Jared Canton, narrated by Joshua Canton, a Steady Chaos production, 2019. Previously on Dolio. The next thing I heard was the door across the office swing back into the wall. The glass at its center detached from the frame, shattered against, then deflected off the wall, cascading a shower of glass particles. Standing in the open door was Brett, his face bloodied, tears streaming, dragging the blood down his neck like a medieval war paint. My eyes darted to the right as Principal Saunders reached forward, and as if in slow motion, threw both hands onto the desk, hurled it, and then threw his body towards Brett. My gaze reverted to Brett in a reflexive glimmer of light extending up from his knee. An earth-shattering boom triggered my hands to my ears as a red mist erupted from Principal Saunders' back. The force thrust his body into Dad. Blood painted them both head to waist as they crumpled under the force of Principal Saunders' deadened body. My eyes flew back to Brett as he cocked the shotgun and raised it again towards Principal Saunders and my dad, both helplessly lying in a pool of blood. No! I yelled as I instinctively sprang into directionless, panicked action. To my right, I caught the nurse emerging from behind the desk she and the secretary had ducked behind. Brett spotted me as I awkwardly closed on him and he swung the shotgun clumsily from his hip. He fired, and I felt a pounding pressure against my right shoulder. It spun me backwards, reeling into a pirouette and I crashed to the ground several feet short of Brett. I placed my palms flat on the ground as blood poured from my right shoulder down my arm, layering my right hand. My eyes leveled with his, and he cocked the gun again. He lowered the barrel at the nurse as she retreated to cover. I pulled myself up from a crouch and ran towards Brett as Dad squirmed free from Principal Saunders' lifeless body onto his backside. Dad scurried backwards on his hands and knees and yelled, No! Ryder! I stumbled forward three steps and fell into Brett, disrupting his arms and fired. We fell to the ground and the gun slid out into the hallway. As we wrestled, bodies whirled past me. Stop this! Please! I heard a woman's voice shout from behind me. I rolled free of Brett onto the tile floor, out of breath, exhausted. My head was spinning and I fought to keep my eyes open. I looked up to see the nurse holding the gun, relief washed over my body, and I dropped my head to the floor. Slowly, I rolled to my back and the nurse rushed to my side. I lifted my head high enough to look over the tips of my shoes. Located squarely between those toes was Dad, five yards back, perched on the office rug, both hands clenched desperately at his midsection. A river of blood bubbled through his fingers. He smiled faintly before his eyes squeezed shut and his head crashed back into the wall. Episode 5, Part 2, The Lawman With a thud, the stack of manila folders came to rest on my desk. After he released them, Grant slapped his hands together twice, as if symbolically wiping them clear of a persistent powdery substance. All yours, Ryder, he managed to force out through a nauseating grin. Many thanks, I said. Twelve in all, three for tomorrow's docket. Only one with any weight to it, though. Life in a Boston City prosecutor's office consisted of two types of cases— There were the majority, which felt inconsequential, petty, redundant, but were alarmingly common. Then there were the significant, hundreds of times less common, but even so, hundreds of times more important. There were the rapes, murders, batteries, and organized crime files that escaped the district attorney's grips and comprised my small niche in the office. They were the types of cases into which I sunk my teeth. Third file from the top. It has Ryder written all over it. Grant plopped down into my chair and cleared a cozy place on my desk with the heel of his shoe. He crossed his legs and perched them in his clearing. Graduating third in my class at Boston University School of Law had provided vast private sector opportunities, but I never wanted to be part of the private sector. Since that afternoon, I hadn't had an interest in mergers, trusts, corporations, or deeply sheltered offshore accounts. I had an interest in victims. Victims were the only meaningful pursuit in justice and without their bravery and forthcoming, there could be no justice at all. As such, I was the first official victim's advocate in the Boston prosecutor's office. To many, I was an unnecessary redundancy. I didn't try cases, give opening statements, or make press clippings. I counseled victims for the stand, empowered them to feel safe in doing so, and made sure that when they did testify, they were prepared, and if possible, confident. I pulled the stack of folders into my lap and leafed through the tags at the top of each folder. Grant had drawn a red star on the third folder down, and I extracted it from the pile. 
The Red Star was his personal calling card for me, a legal batlight of sorts. It was his way of pulling my attention away from other lead prosecutors' files to his own. Fortunately, he generally reserved the Red Star cases for urgent matters, and this case was no different. I cracked the folder open and extracted the cover sheet. File 37643-09 was a rape case. It was the kind of case that requires someone with the abilities that I possessed. Rape cases depend in large part on two types of evidence. First is physical evidence, normally from forensics or the rape kit process that the victim must engage in following the attack. The second type of evidence is testimony. What did the kit turn up? I asked. Nada, Grant fired back. He pulled out a cigarette. I watched his cheeks pucker as he sucked the first blast of toxins into his lungs. Careful guy? I asked, disgusted by the leisure in which Grant and I discuss such matters. In one sense, Grant paused to launch the smoke from his lungs. Keep guessing. He grabbed a file and waved the smoke away from a clearly malfunctioning smoke alarm. He used a condom? Yep. His lone careful act? Grant nodded. More than one accuser? It was an exercise that Grant and I often employed. I would glance at the lead page of the file, and then we'd run down 20 questions and see if I could flesh out the remaining details of the case. Not yet. He in his 20s? Yep. Alcohol? Of course, but incomplete. Rufy? Ding ding! But he claims he didn't give it to her, right? Right again! Did anyone else see the two together? Several. So he admits to the intercourse? Yep. And he claims it was consensual? Of course. So he admits the intercourse, then the condom wasn't necessarily strategic. And did she ask him to wear it? She did. That's a problem. I had seen this in a case before. It's unfortunate the way a jury can interpret the victim's request for the assailant to use protection. Being violated sexually is horrible enough, but getting pregnant, herpes, or something worse reminds you of it for the rest of your life. When a victim is conscious at the beginning of the attack, protection is a difficult request to make, but a wise one that takes an incredibly strong person. Nonetheless, it muddies the consent waters. Was she conscious through the entire ordeal? Yes, but inebriated booze and rohypnol. Setting? College party. Is he a stranger to the victim? Yes. Did she go with him to the scene of the crime willingly? Yes. Do you think we can make a case? It was a question I had to ask. Without meeting the defendant or victim, I was getting information in a vacuum. Woman goes to party, gets drunk, gets roofied, goes into a room with a man willingly, asks him to put on a condom, alleges rape. This is not the fact pattern a juror envisions when they're selected to serve on a rape jury. This is, regrettably, more often than not, how the jury envisions a wild night a girl would regret. I do, I do, I do. His response left minimal room for interpretation. What am I missing? If he was this convinced, this certain, then there was something about the case I simply wasn't reaching. Hint, he asked. His cigarette had burned down to the filter. He jammed it into the side of my steel wastebasket. Please, I said. Wholesome, he said slowly, as if he was on one of those game shows where you use one word to try to compel your teammate to say another. Wholesome. I let the word bounce around in my mind for a moment. Nothing about rape is ever wholesome. In fact, rape is pretty much an acceptable antonym for wholesome. Rape is violent, evil, brutal, a demonstration of power. Wholesome is pure and good, innocent and decent. Does Wholesome refer to one of the parties? Warmer, counsel. Was the victim a virgin? I asked. While it was of little consequence to ascertaining what had truly happened, it was potentially impactful on juror interpretation of what may have happened. No less than yourself, Grant smiled. He still found sexual innuendo and locker room talk entertaining. He was like the bully in a high school football movie's cheesy locker room scene. He was the guy running wildly across the bench between the lockers, snapping his towel at the more docile players. So we have a virgin victim had, he callously corrected. How old is she? I communicated the question as soon as it came to me. And here I thought you were losing it. Grant smiled as he rose from his chair and made his way towards the door to my office. He walked out the door and closed it behind him. I opened the file to page two and glanced down to the victim's information. Seventeen, I read aloud. As I finished the word, the door pivoted open and Grant threw his head inside. Bingo! The door closed again and then opened wide enough to reveal the top portion of his face. His eyes located mine. Did I mention her and her parents just got here? Get to work. Room 3017. 
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed Dolio, please come back for future episodes arriving at regular intervals, and subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast application. Please visit the Steady Chaos Productions YouTube page and subscribe for more content from our production team.